I think it was the year 2006. I was using a book called West of Kabul, East of New York, and of one of my classes in Berkeley. And then I said, uh, I, I sent an email to the author, Mr. Tammy Mansori, and then he was researching his other book on, on history, I believe. And he said, yeah, I'm coming to Berkeley occasionally to go to the library and use the, the material in the library. And I said, how if you have lunch? One of the days that to come to Berkeley. And he accepted that. And uh, I still remember very well. It was a very uh, good lunch in a local Thai restaurant on, on Durant. And uh, after that, of course, I read his other books. And I realized that uh, we have one of the most interesting, one of the best authors, Afghan. I would call him Afghan. He calls himself Afghan American. I can call him Afghan American, whatever you, 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 uh, you're happy with. And, 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 and amongst us, um, Mr. Tami Mansori, or Mir Tami Mansori, was born in, am I allowed to say the, the year of your birth? Or, uh, 1948, I believe. You can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, nowadays you have to be very careful about so many things, you know. Oh, yeah, right. So they, no, they're not. Uh, and and uh, in Kabul, and he attended school in Kabul uh, to a Finnish American mother and Afghan father, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, you go into that. Okay. And uh, and grew up in Kabul, of course, but then attended uh, Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and. Uh, he has written several books. He is the author of uh, West of Kabul, East of New York, as I said, a, a lovely memoir. Destiny Disrupted, A History of the World Through Islamic Eyes, which is also a great, wonderful read. Games Without Rules, The Often Interrupted History of Afghanistan, one of his more recent works. And uh, finally, I think the, 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 the Invention of Yesterday, a 50,000 year history of human culture, conflict, and connection, which was published in two, three years ago, I believe, yeah, 2019, exactly. Um, so it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to have him here. I think it's, 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 and thank you for accepting the invitation to come here. I leave the floor to Mr. Ansari, and uh, a warm welcome to him, of course, yeah. All right, I guess I should turn this on. Is this working? You guys can hear me. <clears throat> well, let me just start by saying thank all of you uh, for being here. And thank you, Professors McLennan, Sternfeld, and Ahmadi for inviting me to be part of this uh, convocation of profound scholars and academics who have uh, taught me so much today. There's been so much resonance for me in the, in the lectures that I've heard. Now, let me confess that I'm not an academic. Uh, I am a, um, uh, I, I, I think I should say I come here not as an expert on anything, but as a specimen of something. <laughs> and I'm going to offer testimony from the point of view of this specimen. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> uh, focus on the issues that have pre preoccupied me all my life, which really center around identity, and culture, and narrative, and uh, these grow out, I think, of the circum out of the circumstances of my uh, of my birth, which um, uh, Professor Ahmadi started to tell you about, but I'm going to elaborate on it more. Uh, as far as I know, although uh, you know the the lecture I just heard makes me think there's there's earlier stuff that I I didn't know. But my, I've grown up with the understanding that my father was among the earliest batches of students that were sent to the West to get a Western education. And, and I think that he was probably, you know, they sent him out in batches of five, and I think he was maybe in the fourth or fifth batch, something like that, sent to the United States. And he met my mother in Chicago, and she became the first American woman to marry an Afghan and go back to Afghanistan with him and uh, live as part of an Afghan family. 
But she didn't actually completely dissolve into the Afghan family as the crucial fact here. Uh, she built a sort of a cluster or a bubble of America around just our nuclear family. And in the course of the next few years, there was a few more of the uh, uh, Afghans who had been sent abroad, each of whom had been warned, you know, brought in specifically and warned by the prime minister of the time, go there and, and get your education, but don't mess with those American women. My father was the first one to break that rule, and the others learned from his mistake because they called him right back immediately. And uh, they waited until they'd gotten their doctorates and then they married their uh, girlfriends and, and they came back. So a small American community uh, developed in Afghanistan. And so I grew up in two worlds and uh, I, was, um, I was equally able to be a part of either. But I wasn't able to be a part of both at the same time. And that's because each was a whole world. And within that context, I was a whole self. But they were two different worlds. And so these were two different selves. And so over the course of time, although, you know, in my childhood, I nimbly went back and forth between the two. But over the course of time, it became more and more a question of, of facing a choice. You know, which am I? Am I an Afghan or am I an American? And the year that I turned 16, I lucked into a scholarship uh, to a boarding school here in America. And so I took that scholarship and I left. I left Afghanistan. And I'm going to just mention that when I left, because I'll, I'll bring this up later, but I remember uh, this one incident that happened just before I left. <clears throat> I went into a room where my uncles were sitting and my father was. And one of my uncles said to me, Bachim, you know, uh, go get your education. This is a good thing. Get your education in uh, America. But when you're done, uh, come back to Afghanistan. Because out there, it's going to be chaos. It's going to be tumult. There's going to be bloodshed, violence, war. But that stuff's never going to reach us in here, in our mountains. Here, the loudest, irritating, noise you're likely to hear is going to be the uh, neighbor's donkey in the next yard brain. And I repeated this anecdote a few times in my early years in America uh, with a smile on my face. And I got to tell you, you know, in later years, given what happened in Afghanistan, I thought about that incident with tears in my eyes. So I left Afghanistan and I made a life in America. Uh, but Afghanistan wouldn't leave me. You know, it's like, uh, I kept any scrap of information that came in about Afghanistan, I was interested and I, I read it. And if, you know, I was the guy that if uh, I was walking along the sidewalk with a group of my friends and a newspaper blew by and I saw it on the, on the sidewalk and there was something, some piece of news about Afghanistan, my friends would look back and there's Tamim crouched on the sidewalk over a newspaper, what's he doing? Oh, there's some little piece of news about Afghanistan, he's reading it. In those early years, there hardly was any scrap of news about Afghanistan. Uh, and I had come here to be my American self. Here, to everyone that knew me, I was that Afghan guy. <laughs> you know? uh, and they didn't know anything about Afghanistan. And uh, the, the one feature of Afghanistan that everybody was familiar with was that it was remote. Uh, that was as much a part of the identity of an Afghan as I experienced it in America in those early years as, let's say, uh, the word trunk is part of the definition of an elephant. If you say elephant, you don't have to say trunk. It goes with the, uh, it goes with the term. So when they said Afghan, it's that guy from that, that remote place. And then, uh, you know, then uh, the, the war started in Afghanistan and my father passed away and all my family came out and a time came when I had uh, virtually no personal connections left with Afghanistan. And um, when the, uh, and I still, you know, I was, I was watching everything and I was reading the news. And there was a moment in 1977 or so that I thought maybe the time has come. Let me go back, take another look at uh, the Afghan identity. My father said, uh, maybe not 
quite yet. Wait and see how things shake out. Things are all tense in Afghanistan. And then the next year there was the coup, and uh, uh, you know the uh, communists took over, and then the next year after that the uh, the Soviet invasion. And so then the 80s became a time when you just couldn't, you know, I couldn't contemplate going to Afghanistan. And after 1993, when the uh, communists fell and the Mujahideen came, uh, it was almost like, you know, for me as a, as a Afghan American in the Bay Area, for me before that moment, any Afghans I met, we were all Afghans. After that moment, when the Mujahideen came in, all of a sudden we were not all Afghans, all of a sudden, we were different groups of Afghans, and people were silent with each other, and there was not that sense of peoplehood and solidarity. Then when the Taliban came, I really thought, that's it. I had nobody left in Afghanistan, basically, and I thought I would never see the place again. That's it. Then came 9-11, and, um, you know, right after 9-11, it finally became possible to contemplate going to that part of the world again. I first went to Peshawar, I went to the refugee camps. I, uh, I knew some people, or some people I knew knew some people that were able to actually get us into the Khyber Pass, and we went to some just across the border, uh, somehow or other, with, with these people, but we couldn't get any further, we came back. But the following year, I actually went to Afghanistan, and I went to Kabul. And I did have one first cousin still left there. And, uh, you know, I didn't know an address, but I kind of knew she lived near Silo, that old bread factory. And I found a, a taxi driver to uh, hire. And I said, I, there's this Silo, and then my cousin lives near there. Is there any chance we could find that place? He said, yeah, why not? We drove to Silo, we started asking people, anybody know where Zoida and Sori, the daughter? Oh yeah, around there. And they knew when I went to the, uh, the house there, and I recognized the house because it was my uncle's house. He'd passed away, but Zoya, that was his daughter. I went in, and you know, the next day or the next day after that, but whatever, very soon, there were people coming by from other compounds in the village. And then they were coming from, I mean, other compounds in the city, excuse me. And then from the village of Diyo, 10 or 20 miles north of the city, they were dropping by because the word had spread amongst you know, amongst the network, uh, that Bache Mirsoib is back. And uh, people I didn't know, they knew me. They said, Riyaz John Chituras, how is your brother Riyaz? How is Rebecca? Khanem Soib, you know, my mother, is she well? Oh, I'm sorry to hear she's not, uh, uh, you know, she's not in good health. Uh, and then uh, uh, one of the women said, uh, so, um, um, you know, are you married? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm married. I'm, I'm not making this up. This, this happened. And she said, well, uh, you're going to need a wife here, so I have some prospects for you in the village. Uh, and um, in the course of these conversations, and I had forgotten Farsi a lot. You know, my Farsi was not very good. My dari, I guess as they call it now, but that language that we all spoke there. Somehow, when I was back in Afghanistan, I very quickly became fluent again. And the stories that were being told, I knew those stories. And I felt really so known. And this is like, I had not set foot in this place for 38 years. And it was as if I had left yesterday and my place at the table had been kept empty because everybody expected me to come back. And also it was as if there was a shape uh, you know, when you take one piece of a puzzle, of a jigsaw puzzle out, and there's a shape there. The rest of the picture is there, but there's this one gap. That one gap was me, and I fit right into it. I just dropped right in. I felt so known. A month later, I'm back in San Francisco. I'm in a bar with my writer friends, and, uh, you know, they come and they want to know what I'm writing now because they know the stuff that I write. And uh, because I'm back from this long and adventurous trip, they uh, uh, celebrate by bringing me, one person brings me a piece of cherry pie, because they know what I like. I like the cherry pies there at, uh, at uh, Lefty O'Doul's uh, sports uh, bar. And somebody else brings me a bottle of Bud Light, uh, because they, A, they know what beer I drink, and they know that I like it in a bottle and I don't want a glass. They didn't know how many siblings I had or who they were or what their names were. They didn't know uh, as, you know, they didn't know how 
my family got from the village of Diyo to Kabul. They didn't know anything about me in the context that I had just been in, in Kabul. But I felt so known there in a, in a whole different way. And these are not two different persons. <laughs> these are two different ways of being a person. So there's something here about identity and what is that thing and how uh, closely it is related to context, to social context. And I thought back to that, um, to that um, incident that happened before I left Afghanistan, what my uncle said, to come back to Afghanistan here, it's always going to be whatever it was. Uh, and, you know, one thing that, that, that jumped out for me was that flavor of remote that, was, that, was, that his comment was redolent with. Um, and, um, and it was not a pejorative sense of remote. Remote was something sweet. Remote was a good thing to be. And, uh, but then the other thing that jumped out at me was that, was that way he spoke of in here, it's gonna be like this, out there, it's gonna be like that, in here, out there, in here, out there. And I realized that's a, such an essential feature of Afghan life as I knew it as a kid growing up. There was, I was in a world that was divided into two separate realms that were completely kept apart, physically embodied by walls. Every, I and everyone I knew, our everyday life happened inside a compound surrounded by walls high enough that we were shielded from the eyes of strangers. And there was something very essential to our way of life about that fact. And, um, um, when I say compound, <laughs> it's the term that I have to use, but it has a connotation when I, when I use it in an English sentence, compound has a sort of a fortress and a kind of a grim feeling to it. And, uh, and it, 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 it links up to prison, <laughs> you know? And that's not what it was for me as a child growing up in Afghanistan. It was more a portal than a, than a prison because the compound that I lived in was part of this inside universe that was the feeling of being at home. There you were with your own people. And it wasn't just that compound. That compound was one of the compounds that my network lived in. And my network were, the central fact about it is we were all related in some way. But there were so many of us that were related in some way. You know, it's like my grandfather had four wives. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, my grandmother, uh, she had five kids, uh, five sons, and then each of the other wives had. And then my grandfather's father, he, I don't know how many wives he had, because that goes back in time before I know. But there was, beyond count was how many people was part of my, that private universe that, that my compound was a portal into. And that portal was into a private universe that existed all over the city, here and there around the city, and it extended on into Diyo, and then that network also extended on to other, other villages beyond. And it was some kind of a village that, that I was part of. And um, so this separation of the private world from the public world matches right up with, but misleadingly, I think, with a sense that most people have of Afghanistan being divided into the women's world and the men's world. The idea that, that that's the separation, or that classically anyhow, that was the separation of, of the world in, uh, in Afghanistan. In fact, you know, this inner, un this private universe was where men, women, and children all lived together. And there was a sense of home there that just didn't exist out there in the public universe. But the public universe was, in fact, accessible only to men. It is, a, it is the case that women, in, when I was a child growing up, women did not leave the compound unless they were wearing a chaudari. This was not true in the village. The, the village was different. This was something that was in the urban world, and it's because out there you met people from other networks that were strangers to you. And 
So I thought about, you know, now that I had come back and then I was thinking about the way uh, Afghans lived when I was young, I started pondering why Afghanistan had developed institutionally in this way. It's true that in the history of the world, there's this sense of home is somehow related to um, you know, children and women, and you know, that there's something different about home and the world. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not stark like it was in, in Afghanistan. It's not so physically embodied by the encirclement within walls. You know, and the, um, uh, and the, um, the anthropologist uh, Louis Dupree once described Afghanistan as an inward looking world because of the physical embodiment that people lived in compounds where the windows did not look out. The windows all looked into a courtyard which was surrounded by the living spaces. And when I went to Afghanistan that time and subsequent times that I've been back and go to the village, it's still like that in the village. And so I, I thought about why it was uh, that Afghanistan had institutionally developed in this way. And I, my own, uh, uh, my own, I'm not a sociologist or, you know, I'm, whatever expertise would qualify me to theorize on this matter, I'm not that expert. And nonetheless, I'm going to theorize on this matter. And I'm going to say that I think institutions, uh, I think societies develop the institutions that they need as mechanisms for dealing with the challenges that they're meeting, that they're Groping, grappling with in their environment and that they expect to grapple with. I think that cultures evolve in the same way as biological organisms evolve, as a response to the environment in which they are. And so the environment is on the one hand physical and on the other hand social. And so you look at the physical landscape of Afghanistan, and this is some place where, you know, there some stuff that Sarah said this morning really resonated for me. You look at the physical landscape of Afghanistan, and what is it? It's a, it's a huge pile of mountains that spill down into a, a desert so hot and dry, not too many people can actually live there. So the habitable portions of Afghanistan are largely steep valleys, cracks, chasms, canyons. And people, when they settle into one of these, they're going to be interacting a lot more prolifically with other people up and down the stream that runs down the middle of this little canyon or valley or whatever it is, than they are with people in some other canyon or valley or whatever it is, 50 miles, you know, to the east or west or whatever. And, you know, that's, uh, uh, that means that that prolific interaction among people is going to recirculate all those elements that distill a culture into a purer form of itself. By culture here, I mean something a little more specific than, you know, um, uh, the food you eat or the religion you have. I, I mean even more uh, specifically that the people up and down this valley are going to understand each other in a way that is not going to be possible with someone who is from another valley and has different historical memories and different sets of ancestors that they tell stories about. You know, forget the uh, they might speak, uh, uh, you know, they might speak uh, Uzbek and you might speak Pashto over here. That's, you know, that's the crude differentiation between the, the culture of one valley and another. I think uh, the landscape of Afghanistan favors the emergence of a patchwork of what I would like to call monocultures. Monocultures, you know, I've never, I've, I've, I don't know if this term exists, but uh, the term struck me once when the journalist uh, Frank Browning complained about identity politics, he said, what it does is instead of uh, giving us a multicultural society, it gives us a shattered kaleidoscope of monocultures. And I thought, huh, monocultures. Okay, that's, that resonates for me in terms of what this physical landscape of Afghanistan favors the emergence of in this particular kind of physical uh, environment. But then there's the social environment. There's the location of Afghanistan. And, um, um, you know, it's, uh, again, this was touched upon earlier today, but it's between worlds of civilization that are very different from one another. There's the Persian world to the west. There's the, you know, there's the Central Asian steppes to the north that was classically or historically inhabited by pastoral nomadic Turkish and Mongol tribes. And then there's to the, to the south and, and southeast, 
uh, there's India, an Indian civilization. And then further over, there's China. We shouldn't even, uh, you know, we shouldn't forget it because uh, the, the rivers of traffic that moved among these worlds of civilization included China. And the, the Silk Road is part of that story, and, and there's other rivers of traffic. Well, when you have rivers of traffic coming from different civilizations through a patchwork of monocultures, what you have is both diversity and, you know, inward-looking monoculturalism are somehow both uh, existing in the same framework. So now, how is it possible for a society to harmoniously and peaceably function with both of these things going on? How does, how does it resolve that paradox? And I look at these inward-looking uh, the architecture of the Afghan village and these compound walls shielding yourself from the eyes of strangers. And, and I think that's exactly what we're looking at here. We're looking at a society that has evolved to meet the challenges presented by this paradox of, of diversity and, um, and monoculturalism. Of course, that can only work if there is some framework that will enable all of these different monocultures to somehow at the same time find some communal worldview that they can within which one monoculture can can uh, can communicate and interact with another and afghanistan had that uh, islam was that framework and islam in afghanistan and back in my day was loose enough that there could be lots of different islams <laughs> you know and, and uh, uh, you didn't automatically, you know, if, if you got down to like, what is Islam? Oh, you say it's that? No, I look it up in the book. It's this other thing. That didn't seem to happen when I was a kid. Uh, there was a sort of an appeal to, we're all Muslims here. You know, we can get along. Uh, uh, an appeal to an idea that being a Muslim is the same as being a good person. And, you know, there was the five times of prayer and there was the month of fast and there was these these really uh, big uh, uh, structural features that enabled people to feel like they're all part of the same thing. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to just pause or, or sideline for a moment to, to, to say that I feel like in my growing up years, that system was kind of working, you know. It's, it's such a trope now to hear, as you, uh, I think it was you, Dr. Ahmadi, that quoted Biden saying something to the effect that, eh, these people are savages, they're always fighting. And if it wasn't Biden, it's others. They say this all the time, <laughs> you know, and these guys are fighting all the time and, and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't true in my day. There was a source of potential tension always. But in fact, uh, you know, my sister, when uh, she was in grade school, elementary school, she went to a public school and she'd leave the house and get on a bus and go to the school. And then she'd come back and on the way, she might stop at uh, my grandmother's house because it was on the way because my grandmother made good soup and she liked to get a uh, little soup for lunch. And then she'd come back and we didn't have telephones so there was no telling when she'd come back. I'm gonna tell you, I would not have dreamed of letting my daughters go to school on a public bus in San Francisco when they were in first and second and third grade. So there was something about that culture that was very safe. Um, but of course, it couldn't last. Because the other fact of the social geography of Afghanistan and its location was such that, especially once we enter the era of, um, you know, uh, Western imperialism, the forces pushing in were, you know, huge. The, the, the powers that wanted, that wanted to gain Afghanistan as the platform for their contention and contest with these other global powers uh, threatened to just crush <laughs> this poor country. And uh, that accounts for uh, another aspect of the pattern of Afghan uh, institutional structure and uh, its politics, which is, uh, you know, the same in here, out there pattern 
at a global, at a larger scale, so that Afghanistan in the first two centuries of the Western imperialism project became sort of this emblematic fortress kingdom, just keeping everybody out. That 19th century uh, uh, King Abdurrahman, as a deliberate act of policy, would not let railroads be built into Afghanistan because they wanted to make it hard for anybody to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to rub in with Afghans and 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 uh, infect them with the culture of the outside world. But on the other hand, the the global, I mean, the the governing elite of Afghanistan, they wanted the things that made the West these Western powers so powerful and so able to, uh, you know, exert their will and, and so prosperous. They wanted science, they wanted technology, they wanted medicine, they wanted electricity, they wanted to build roads, they wanted cars. Why wouldn't they? Of course they did. The thing is, it's really hard to let in artifacts and technology without letting in culture. And it's also the case now uh, now I'll, I'll, I'll segue to another point. This business of the, uh, the inner world, the inner universe of home, where you could walk in and you were among your own and you were warm and you were safe, that thing that Afghanistan had was problematically interwoven with the sequestration of women. And the governing elite of Afghanistan knew that they had to change that. There's no way, it's not a matter of choice, there's just no way that the sequestration of women is going to be able to survive in a country that's going to be in the modern economy of the modern world. That's just not going to happen. But how do you open the doors and open the public world to women without losing this cherished, warm, private universe? Well, they were trying, and you know something? They made great strides in the, in the 16 years that I was in Afghanistan, there was so much social progress that way. Uh, I would say there was 500 years of social progress in 16 years. And in, and in those years, that was when the, the country first found a way to start getting rid of this, this burqa thing, this chaudhari thing, this body bag that women had to wear. And, and they did it in this, in this way that wasn't about making the rule that now we're not gonna have that anymore. Uh, the royal family said, they, they called in the, uh, the ulama, the religious scholars, and said, we're having a little trouble here because we can't find the passage in the, uh, in the Quran or in the Hadith or in the scholarly sources that indicate to us about the, the, the burqa and exactly how it should be made and you know what kind of cloth and stuff. And the scholar said, oh, we can find that for you, sir. And they looked and they looked and they couldn't find it because, of course, it's not there. And so then the royal family said, well, we're not going to have that anymore, and they abolished it. And then they uh, had the first time, for the first time, they had a, uh, a, uh, a school in which one girl <laughs> entered a classroom with a, a school, uh, a whole room full of boys, and joined the 10th grade. And that one girl was my sister. She was the first girl to sit in a classroom with, with uh, you know, to be, she was the, she was a trailblazer of uh, co-education in Afghanistan. But by the next year, there was lots of them. And by the next year after that, many more. But uh, it's like, uh, you know, the, the, the conservatism of the structure of Afghanistan was such that it's like opening a, a little crack in a wall behind which is the ocean. The weight of the water was such that it just burst through. And there's no, uh, it's not surprising that in the next few years, the social fabric kind of tore. And then, you know, the, the, the coup d'etat happened, and then the Soviets came. And now I often hear uh, the word uh, Afghanistan, 20 years of war. And, I'm, and I, all I can do is say, no, it's not 20. It's at least 40. And it's, and, and, um, so now I want to, uh, I want to generalize from this. I want to say, you know, for outsiders, when, when the country was itself trying to figure out a way to alter the social institutions and, uh, you know, um, move into a time when Afghanistan would be a, a 
co-educational society, so to speak, and women would have equal access to everything that men had, and yet try to hold on to the realm of privacy, which enabled monocultures to live as they wanted without being without having to compromise with the next monoculture over. It was a difficult task, but I think that's what they were trying to steer towards and manage. When outside forces came and said, we're going to change this country because it's full of uh, this problematic thing, they didn't know there was anything to protect. Why? Because the outsider traveling through Afghanistan wasn't even aware of this inner universe. Of course they weren't. That's the whole point of the high walls that shield them from the eyes of strangers. Nobody was supposed to see. So when you think about the existence of this private realm, and then you look at uh, the uh, pictures that um, Dr. Um, uh, Karimi, I think, uh, uh, with the, your blimps, you know, you, you're up there and you showed pictures of a city in which you could see those compounds surrounded by walls and you could see everything in there. Uh, Imagine the amount of, you know, psychological difficulty it is to be so robbed of privacy. And, and when I think about that, I, I think about right after 9-11, there was a woman, uh, a writer from Denmark who wrote a book called The Bookseller of Kabul. You guys, anybody read that? Okay. So the bookseller of Kabul went and, and she said, I'm, I want to live with your family and... and uh, and, uh, you know, I want you to uh, agree that I can say what I want. And he was like, oh, yes, I have nothing to hide. Say whatever you want. So she wrote that book, and there's this scene in which uh, she goes to the, the, the public bath with this guy's mother, and she has a page or two describing uh, the mother's vagina. And, you know, she said, hey, he said, I'm not going to, control. I could say whatever I wanted. It never occurred to him to say, and please don't describe my mother's vagina. Um, so there's a sense here of what privacy means that's very different for the people that were living there then, and then these people from the outside. Um, and um, I think that, uh, you know, there's all of the things that you guys have said about the economic circumstances that have been problematic for Afghanistan, about the political circumstances, the ethnic rivalries, and all of that. Those are all true, and I, you know, I, I'm not minimizing that at all. But I think that toss into the mix there, the, the, the dismantling of the walls of separation between these realms of privacy that within which monocultures can develop so that every person is now in the presence of strands of values and attitudes and ideas that are coming from that, are, that were meaningful and coherent within some little monoculture, but is not in every monoculture. Uh, it's not doesn't make it makes for a a culturally incoherent landscape. And now, uh, I think it's time to uh, generalize here, and I want to suggest that Afghanistan was wrestling with something and failed to wrestle it to the mat, frankly, uh, failed to solve it, but Afghanistan was wrestling with something that everybody here is going to be wrestling with no matter where you live in the years to come. Uh, because, you know, uh, if you think back to, well, you can't think back to a thousand years ago, but if, <laughs> If you can think about how the world was a thousand years ago, the world was a patchwork of monocultures. They were just huge. They, they, they were zones that occupied a large uh, territory uh, because technology was such that a message couldn't travel instantly from one place to 500 miles away. So most people lived in a more or less coherent universe with a worldview that made the, uh, the, the discourse make sense when one person talked to another. They knew what they were talking about. They shared assumptions. And where one civilization overlapped with another, there was going to be some conflict there and some incoherence and some working out. And that was a good thing. There was, 
that, that was a, uh, you know, that kind of incoherence was a source of creative invention and innovation. Um, and distance, physical distance did then what walls did, compound walls did in Afghanistan in the days of my childhood and earlier. Um, but that era is over because there is no such thing as physical distance now. Now, uh, the place that we live is called cyberspace. Um, you know, we are not in cyberspace right here, right now, but uh, all of us probably go online and many of us say, oh, I never look at Twitter. <laughs> and many of us say, oh, I hate Facebook and I'll never go on there. But actually everybody's kind of like in that, in that universe of Facebook-y, truthiness, Twitter-y uh, reality, where you're likely to hear, you know, to hear yourself bump up against anybody, any other opinion. And when you look at Twitter, I never look at Twitter, but, I, but I'm aware of, <laughs> okay, I, I look at Twitter some. <laughs> Uh, but when you look at Twitter, uh, what you find is there's not conversation on Twitter. There's a, a Twitter thread as all people agreeing with each other, each trying to agree more heartily. Twitter is, a, and all social media is functioning as a way for people to cluster with others that think the same thing they do. And this, I feel, is uh, a, a symptom of a search for coherence. You know, people do not want to live in a world where nothing where other people's utterances make no sense. So we see all over the world now, people clustering to, to rebuild some uh, old uh, uh, cultural, structural model or cluster of ideas so that they can be inside of a, of a social community with people who agree with them and, and who make sense to them. And I think that uh, uh, the manifestations of it that we see are inseparable from populism. You know, identity po politics is, 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 some people celebrate it, oh, I'm, you know, finding my identity as, as this or that. But if you're finding your identity in your ethnic uh, community or your skin color or your whatever, your enemies are also doing that too. <laughs> You know, white nationalism is uh, inevitable in a world of identity politics. Now, the thing is, however, um, what Afghanistan failed to achieve, uh, the world has to achieve. We have to find a way to enable coherent cultures that are not like other cultures that are like themselves to develop, and that can only happen in the presence of intercommunication among people who are not just agreeing with each other, but are, but are having a conversation with a frame, within a framework of cultural discourse. And that has to happen because uh, cultural diversity is as crucial as biological diversity. Cultural diversity is how we come to have, uh, um, you know, the equipment to deal with the problems that are upcoming and we don't know what those problems are. We can imagine we know them from what we see right now, but there's no telling what 10 years from now we'll be facing. So it's an absolute necessity that there be many cultural answers to the world or responses to the world, many different ways, so that one of them could be the adaptive one for a problem we don't know what it is yet. Cultural diversity is important, but we also need a framework within which all cultures can see themselves as part of the same communal big story. Um, and what Afghanistan failed to do, the world sort of has to do. Now, now I'm going to segue over to the, the last thing that I wanted to, uh, to raise. How, how am I doing on time? I guess I'm almost out. Um, <clears throat> this is the last thing I wanted to say. I was all confused about my identity when I was a kid, and was I this or was I that? And, uh, and, about, and Af Afghan identity was a particular part of that. And I look around now and I see that I'm so not alone in that now. And, and with other Afghans, you know, Afghans in the diaspora, it is not the case 
that Afghans in the diaspora have just melted in and become whatever, you know, Germans or Americans. There is a, there is a, a desire amongst Afghans in the, di, in the diaspora to identify, to, to, to assert an Afghan identity. And in fact, uh, uh, there's a, an assertion of entitlement to, to define what that identity is. And, you know, my daughter, who had nothing to do with Afghanistan, after 9-11, she started to think of, of herself as an Afghan more. And then she became involved with, um, you know, she's, she moved to Brooklyn, she became involved with Afghan American Artists and Writers Association. And what she discovered to her own uh, mystification in a way, was that themes and uh, ideas that she thought were part of her own imaginative uh, upwellings were familiar to the other uh, Afghan-American uh, writers and artists. Um, and, it, and, and it occurred to her that these are not actually her own individual ideas and themes and so on, that they are some uh, earlier Afghan roots speaking through her. And she and these other kids who have grown up in Brooklyn or wherever, uh, are are finding a sense of community with each other and 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 you know they describe it as um, you, you know that that Afghanistan is something and and they keep reporting this experience they have of um, uh, you know if you're an American you have to fill out forms and they say are you a white black Hispanic uh, Asian or Pacific Islander or other and for most of these Afghan American kids, the closest is other, but other doesn't feel like what they are. And, and neither does none of the above. They feel like to be Afghan is not to be none of the above. To be Afghan is to be something. And when you think about that, it's interesting to me that in these 40 years of war, although now there's a little bit, somebody mentioned some stuff about Pashtun nationalism that, that, that maybe goes against this, but for the most part in these, in all these years of war, none of these factions fighting other factions have raised the banner of separatism. None of them have raised the banner of, we want our own country. No, they want this country. <laughs> they want Afghanistan. And, and uh, they just want to rule it. But, but they want this Afghanistan. And this brings me to, you know, uh, um, somebody earlier today said, um, Afghanistan, you know, they showed the map and they said this never existed before uh, the imperialists got here. And that's true, of course, uh, but none of, no countries existed <laughs> 700 years ago. There was not such a thing as a country then. There were empires then. And there's, there has more or less consecutively been some sort of an empire here. You know, there's the Kushan Empire, then there was the Yaftali Empire, then there was other empires, then there was Ghaznavid Empire, then there was Ahmad Shah's empire. I've, I've skipped a few in there, but you know, the, the edges were vague, but there was always something here. And it's because of those things that I mentioned earlier, the physical landscape, the rivers of traffic going through. This is the place where it's been like a laboratory for the thing that we're trying to, we're gonna have to try to solve in the world at large. It's been the laboratory where people have been working out how to deal with the paradox of diversity and cultural coherence at the same time. So that's, that's what I think uh, I, I had to tell you guys, and I'm done if you guys have any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, dear. So as I said, you know, let's make it more conversational. Same is here. Uh, any question? Yeah, you can go first. Yeah, thank thank you for your uh, your approach. Uh, like you talk about the uh, multicultural society and uh, use the term uh, uh, mono uh, mono uh, monolineal society. It's solved my question, but uh, I wanna uh, hear uh, your opinion about something else. Okay. And, uh, and I wanna also hear uh, 
the roles of uh, uh, women uh, in Afghan uh, culture and especially in the uh, Republic government uh, uh, in Afghanistan from uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Rahmani. Yeah, uh, my question uh, is uh, uh, like, uh, like people in, in even uh, Western countries, they are thinking that uh, Afghanistan is a patrilineal or patrilocal society uh, and uh, where the male are breadwinner and the women's they are just working in a in a home uh, but uh, it's 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 a different thing uh, you you explain like uh, in in a, in a remote areas uh, women's are also working with the males and and, uh, and uh, it's considered like the women's are the uh, breadwinner for uh, uh, for the whole society for the uh, for the home yeah uh, my question in a, is about the uh, girls education and uh, there are uh, the militants the current invaders argument about the girls education that the uh, uh, they are going that uh, that the girls education is the cultural and uh, social issue of Afghanistan, which are which is not like what what's your opinion? And uh, uh, yeah, and, and also from uh, 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 Ambassador Rahmani, uh, if, if uh, she can talk about the rules of uh, Afghan women in a in a uh, republic government and uh yeah it will be much appreciated thank you so much for your interesting talk uh th thank you I, you know i i couldn't quite uh, catch your uh, everything you said but um uh, i think uh, the the uh the the education of women and the participation of women in in full public life is the goal to be achieved in afghanistan and i think islam has been problematic for achieving that goal I think uh, that doesn't mean that I'm saying Islam necessarily dictates that women have to stay in the home and men have the public world. I'm only saying that the river of tradition in Islam made it more likely that Islam would interweave those two things and lock them together and say, you can't do one without the other. You can't have a sense of home without uh, keeping the women in there. And so I think that uh, the, um, the rectification of that problem in Afghanistan is linked to the, the, the uh, movement to, to find, you know, to, to, to do something with Islam. You know, people who are Muslims need to be uh, rethinking Islam. And it's problematic in Islam because of the, the long tradition of saying you can't have innovation, you have to say, any changes, just a misinterpretation of the original text. That's been the problematic, you know, that's been the stumbling point. And, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, the fact that I, I, f I feel like, you know, and, and this is why I was uh, um, drawn to your, uh, uh, your, your name, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember, sir, but you talked about, um, you know, the, the literary tradition of, of Islam in Afghanistan and, you know, uh, resurrecting people, trying to connect back to that. Um, I think that's really crucial in Afghanistan. I think that's a wonderful thing of the NR, whatever the, the acronym was for the group, the National Liberation Front or whatever it was. I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I, I think as Islam, you know, the way I see it, hey, the first convert to Islam, the first person Prophet Muhammad told about uh, about his revelation uh, was his boss. Who was his boss? A woman, his wife. You know, it's like, and she was a commercial powerhouse. Uh, women were important in early Islam. I think people who want to find a way to reinterpret Islam to open it up can look in Islamic history itself. But I think it's not possible in Afghanistan based on the, you know, on what the culture is and has been to allow the progressive changes in Afghanistan be characterized uh, for the majority of Afghans as leaving Islam and becoming enlightenment Western, <laughs> you know, West, uh, Western people. Uh, it has to be something people find their own way to in which they 
are holding on to the cherished traditions and yet moving into some new interpretation of the future. Uh, I, uh, this isn't specifically about women, but uh, you know, my uh, great, great, great grandfather, maybe I missed a great there, I don't know how far back he was, but uh, he was way back there. But I have an ancestor who's a Sufi poet and uh, he has a shrine near Kabul and I went there and uh, while I was sitting next to his tomb, his uh, acolytes began singing from his poetry. And they were singing something that, um, uh, that was, um, uh, you know, one of those poems that the second line of the couplet is always the same. And it was, um, and the first line was things like, in the uh, mosque, in the church, or in the temple, it's all has the coloring of love. If you're in the, uh, if you're the wine, you're the copper, the one who's pouring the wine, it all has the color of love. And, you know, he was singing this really sort of expansive uh, thing that was completely within, you know, nobody in his day would have said, oh, you're not a Muslim. He was, he was totally a Muslim, but he was so much at the other end from these Islamist uh, radicals who, who have taken over Afghanistan. And I'm just gonna say that this contention about who can define what an Afghan identity is, right now, it extends from the Taliban in power in Afghanistan who say, to be an Afghan means you have to follow the Sharia as we have, in, as we have written it, and that means you lock up the women, to people out in the diaspora community who embrace non-binary gender identities and say, this is, uh, Part of you know being an Afghan includes something this expansive out from that core. So I'd say that the matter is still in contention. We're not talking about a military struggle here. We're talking about a conceptual struggle, an artistic struggle, a struggle of ideas. And I love to see that keep going. And and I want okay, I want my side to win, but I probably shouldn't say that. Neither. So uh, yesterday, um, Ambassador Romani spoke about how Afghanistan both is inside geographical regions, right, in the sense of South Asia, Central Asia, Middle East, yet not, yeah. right, that it's always escaped. So this kind of goes, the, many of the talks have kind of touched on this. It's both inside geographical structures and yet never fits. And I was curious if you could draw your remarks into that, because I do think at some level, every paper on this thinking about Afghanistan in a global context has come around this problem, yeah. right? It's in it, but it's not of it. Well, you know, I, I, I think actually that's kind of what my whole talk was coming to. And that's what I kind of was saying is that Afghanistan has been has been separate from, from its surroundings, but its surroundings have gone through it, and it has always been the place where it was something. What is that something? We don't know. You know, it, it, isn't, it isn't new. Um, it isn't necessarily whatever this something is. It's not wed to Islam, because Afghanistan is the region wherein it is thought that the, uh, you know, the ancestral sources of both Zoroastrianism and Vedic, Vedic religion, which evolved into Hinduism, that's where that started. And the oldest written Buddhist text was found in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, so, and those Buddhas in Bamyan were built around the time that uh, Hazrat Muhammad was born. I didn't realize it was that late, but that, that was the case. So Afghanistan has been, has been many things, but it's always been that thing that I've just talked about. It's been where rivers of traffic flowed through and they had to find a way to deal with, we're all different, but we wanna also have, be ourselves amongst our own people. And um, uh, I've just learned that in the most ancient of civilizations at the time that the Indus Valley civilization, the early origins of Egyptian civilization, uh, the uh, 
Yellow River dynasties of China, when those were flourishing, there was a fifth river culture, and it was on the, what was then, you know, I don't, uh, I was gonna say what was then called the Oxus River. No one knows what it was called then, but the river that used to be called the Oxus, now it's called the Amu. There was a civilization, there was an urban civilization there that was on a par with those other ones, is what they, they're thinking. And as best they can tell, it's, its existence and its prosperity and everything that it was depended entirely on trade. It wasn't what it produced, it's what went through there, is what enabled that to become a big urban civilization of its time. So Afghanistan is that place. <laughs> and I think we should be looking at it and what happened to it from that point of view. Excellent. Um, you were talking about um, a time in the United States where the Afghans in your community were considered themselves Afghans, but then after the Soviet invasion, it grew silent, the, the connection was frayed. Along what lines did those, that separation happen? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to characterize that uh, because uh, when it happened, I didn't really know you know, I was not really aware of what lines there could be. I knew that there was, you know, Hazaras were a, a oppressed minority in Afghanistan and Tajiks didn't get along with Pashtuns and, you know, those things I, I knew about it, but I wasn't aware of all the different factions and parties, uh, you know, uh, at the time when the Mujahideen were fighting the, uh, the Soviets, you know, I was only aware that uh, Hikmatyar was making trouble for Massoud and vice versa. Um, so, uh, all I will say is that the projects to, uh, um, you know, to raise money to go uh, uh, clear landmines in Afghanistan, those suddenly mysteriously just died away. Nobody was talking about it anymore. And they were not seeking each other out to do joint projects. And I fell away from it then too. All right, any other questions? Oh. Um, I truly enjoyed how you described uh, the uh, past and uh, the existence of this uh, monoculture, as you uh, refer to it. But on the other hand, as historically, Afghanistan has been a crossroad. You what? Crossroad. Like civilizations past, trade past, goods past. And as a result of that, it was while there were the villages, clans having their monocultures, as you characterize, that they were also very individualistic. The way we traded over time and during the history, and then we continued to be. But then there was those gluing factors that you also sp uh, spoke about. In addition to Islam, the way it was like, yeah, we are Muslim and, you know, like there is certain things we do. There were also very deep cultural characteristics, like Absolutely. Afghanistan's hospitality, the way a guest is treated. A guest has absolute protection. Absolutely. Uh, even if, 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 if you know that the guest is an enemy, and there is stories of that and, and how it was even manipulated, <laughs> given that it was known about the Afghans. The, the way the Afghans were um, honoring many things, including women, the biggest solvers of the biggest conflicts at the end would be women. There was a practice among very conservative groups, including part of the Pashtun Wali code, that, that when the women would put the veil down, that's when people would come down and solve things. That's, that's it. So there were a lot of those traits and traditions and cultural values that were lost along the way, particularly over the past 40 years that you referred to. As you were talking, I couldn't help to dream this, or relive the stories or, that my parents and my grandparents told me, and also the little memories that I had left myself 
under the uh, Soviets. It was in the time of peace. But even then, I lived in a city. Everybody knew you, the peace, the, the, the sense of security that you were talking. There wasn't real security that I grew up under. There was bombs and missiles and all of that happening. But at the same time, um, at the very early age, I was able to travel and take winter classes in a far school and walk back to my house and nobody was worried. Uh, I, I, I don't let my daughter of the same age to do the same thing now in uh, District of Columbia, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, that, but that over time and more and more sort of dissolved, it disappeared, yeah. it evaporated. If, and then just listening to the lecturers today, it gave me so much hope that maybe there is a way to find somehow to record, to relive, to revive that. Because uh, again, over the past 20 years, despite all the efforts that we made, I think we were terribly suffering from um, not only poor leadership, um, lack of functioning in institutions, but we were also really suffering from uh, a disrupted culture, the fabrications that, that had dissolved. So then, then you spoke about the cyberspace, this new uh, diversity issue that the world has to resolve, which we couldn't resolve at the cultural level. Now, if you bring the issues of Afghanistan and Afghans to this space, to the, to the cyberspace, first of all, and somewhat, I, I'm, I would like to say it jokingly, but it's a reality that, that if, if you are trying to find a tweet or a post that people who are writing below it do not agree, look at Avran's posts. They never agree <laughs> with one another. Um, but then how, do you think that there is a way that with this new phenomena, that lost culture could be revived? And in addition to that, everything that, that I, I, I really will end with this is that, Everything I have heard during this symposium has been so refreshing. And thanks to all of you for organizing and putting this amazing thing. How, how could this feed into all of that? Because this, this, this is something that I have never experienced to this extent, Afghans talking different aspects of Afghanistan. Well, <laughs> you know, um, I think that first of all, there is a um, there is a uh, uh, an aspect of what you just said that I would say we can't do that we can't go back to anything that was but we can go forward to something that has the values we recognize that we cherish from what was and build it in some new way so I I think the fact I have a, a fundamentally hopeful kind of attitude towards all this stuff because I know that. Uh, the emergence of the of that larger world culture that we need cannot be done by fiat and it can't be done quickly. It can only be done by a by a the the onward persistence of intercommunication amongst different people and amongst different communities. So we knowing that we can forward that and we can promote that in some way. We can promote when we see people clustering into communities of opinion that are repeating themselves, that's something, there's something wrong with that. We have to break that up somehow, that can't happen. And, um, um, you know, I think um, I started out by talking about the flavor of remote that uh, Afghanistan had. And the last time I went there in 2012 it was, and I, I wanted that flavor, I just wanted to, because I'd had it before in Afghanistan, you know, uh, even after the, the bombings of the Mujahideen and the Soviets, I went back after 9-11 and 
And we went to Panjshir and we went to Pahmon and we went to some other country spots. And we sat down and just anybody who happened to be around came around and gave us mulberries and we sat and we talked and they, uh, uh, you know, and, and they told uh, fanciful stories about how many Taliban they killed. You know, ah, ma, I killed 72 myself. <laughs> and then conversation ran out and then somebody, when there was silence, then somebody would say, Ho, Megzara. And uh, for me, Megzara was the quality of Afghan life. Megzara means it just keeps flowing on by, you know, and that was what, what it felt like to be Afghan. So uh, I wanted that, I wanted to taste that again, and I landed in Kabul in 2012. I knew right away that flavor ain't here. Kabul is just like Istanbul, New York, Paris. It's, a, it's one of the global cities. And someone said, well, you're not going to find the city. You got to go out to the country. So we went to Bomyon and we didn't uh, find it. Uh, you know, they had, um, it, was, it was a smaller city, but it was a city. And somebody said, well, let's go out to uh, Valley of the Dragon. You know, there's some crack in the earth. So we started driving out that way and we, we drove beyond where there was a road. And there was nothing up there but just hills and you know there, were, there wasn't even a road some they somehow knew which way to go and out there i look up and i see a, a village you know mud regular just like any other afghan village it's way up there and i see a little sliver of white and i look give me the binocs what is that i look it's a satellite dish what these guys have a satellite dish what <laughs> how do they how do they have power here well, my friends who lived there said, oh, they, they have solar panels here in there. And I said, well, you know, how do, what do they, uh, you know, how do they get, uh, they have to buy these solar panels, how do they buy it? They said, well, you know, they have opium and uh, they, they monetize it. It's, it's just opium itself as a form of cash because you can, uh, and uh, I said, well, what could, they listen, what could they watch on their TV if they have satellite dish? They said, well, they probably, uh, might get the Afghan Star, which is a, which was a um, music competition show modeled after um, after uh, American Idol, and I'm like, wait, they're watching something cloned off American Idol, which itself was cloned off British pop idol, and then I learned that they they uh, one village will have one motorcycle, which they buy with opium, which is taken to um, uh, you know Tajikistan or to one of those processed into and then taken to Europe, which goes to America, and they buy a motorcycle that's made in China specifically for this market. I'm like, wait, remote has changed its meaning now. The way you hear that word used now is uh, working remotely. It no longer means disconnected. Now it means connected. And I, I told my, my daughter all this. She said, oh yeah, don't you know? there's these icons on google maps haven't you seen them no i don't know if you guys have seen them there's these little icons and you can go to afghanistan when you find one of these icons you click on it it brings you down and what it brings you to is someone who was there and it could have been yesterday and they've taken a picture with something that enables you to, to use your clicker to get a 360 view degree view around from where they are and you can you can come up and see where that is in respect to uh, the rest of Afghanistan, or you can go down. And I found one, she showed me one that was for Diburi, my where I grew up, that neighborhood. And I was able to go down and see that now it's a park in the city. And I was able to see individual blades of grass sitting in my office in San Francisco. So Afghanistan is remote again, and it's part of the whole, <laughs> I'm sorry, that had nothing to do with your question. I just wanted to, I wanted to tell you guys that, that anecdote. Uh, do I see any other hands up? I can't pull. Oh, that's a perfect answer. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.